In this video, we're going to talk about care ethics, which is, um, again, a moral theory, and it's often classified as a type of uh, situational virtue ethics. So it's sort of a sub-variety of Aristotle's virtue ethics that emphasizes the virtue of care and the cultivation of care for and of others as the foundation of morality. And it also allows for situational interpretation. So this is Nell Noddings, and she's an American feminist, educational leader, and philosopher. And she's best known for her work in the philosophy of education, educational theory, and ethics of care. So a few of her grounding ideas are, you know, she sets off by noticing that most personal moral dilemmas are actually relational dilemmas that require dialogue, not monologue. So what she means by that is that when we find ourselves in moral dilemmas. And a dilemma is simply when you are not quite sure how to behave in a certain situation. What's the right thing to do when you have that question? What Nottings notices is that this, you, these dilemmas arise in relation to other people, right? Um, so to suggest that the way you resolve moral dilemmas is by having an inner monologue and running for running the categorical imperative through your head or the greatest happiness principle through your head that that's just not an adequate response when the situation or the dilemma is relational in the first instance. It has to do with other people and specific circumstances that need attention, not some, not you um, fleeing into your inner self and running some abstract principles. So this bullet point pretty much sums that up. Our moral obligations are not created through the rational logic of the categorical imperative or the calculations of the utilitarian calculus. Our moral obligations are instead created by the caring response, she claims. And like I said in the first slide, this is often considered a type of virtue ethics because of the focus that's put upon cultivating the virtues of caring, sympathy, empathy, sensitivity. Um, another point here is that Care ethics are is um, care ethics is the ethical theory that is taught most prominently and commonly in um, like to doctors and nurses, right? So it's um, a very important bioethical or medical ethics principle. Right? Cultivate these virtues: caring, sympathy, empathy sensitivity. Little bit of background. This is um, David Hume, a uh, very I guess famous, right? But um, empiricist philosopher from the 18th century. And there's a quote and it's verbose and clunky because of the time it was um, written, right? But this was his idea. He says, the final sentence, it is probable, which pronounces characters and actions amiable or odious, praiseworthy or blamable, that which stamps on them the mark of honor or infamy, approbation or censure, that which renders morality an active principle and constitutes virtue our happiness, and vice our misery, it is probable, I say, that this final sentence depends on some internal sense or feeling which nature has made universal in the whole species. For what else can have an influence of this nature? Now, although this is actually two sentences, how's that first one for 
a very complex sentence, right? But bottom line, morality is born of and is constituted by feeling, right? Emotions, not reason, he argued. Now, a little bit more background for Nell Nodding's care ethics is, and we've encountered Carol Gilligan in this course before in the very beginning, but um, this is Carol Gilligan, and she's an American feminist, ethicist, and psychologist, and she's best known for her work with and against Lawrence Kohlberg's theory of the stages of moral development, and her book, In a Different Voice from 1982, um, was incredibly influ influential in what's known as feminist um, moral theory, feminist ethics. So here is that chart, and I know we've looked at this before, but as a reminder, because Nell Nodding's theory is based on a lot of this thinking, Lawrence Kohlberg had a certain set of... Um, descriptions or definitions for each stage of moral development, right? So he developed these two columns here, essentially, that in throughout a person's lifetime, they go through, regarding morality, they go through a pre-conventional, a conventional, and a post-conventional stage. The pre-conventional stage is basically when you're you know really young it's based it's animalistic right how to behave is driven solely by survival instinct the conventional stage when you're a little older is basically herd mentality how to behave is dictated by other people's perception of you and the post conventional stage is supposed to be rational and autonomous, where how to behave is dictated by a rational consideration and balance of the other two stages and taking into account the particular situation you're in. In a sense, it's reason-based. You're actually thinking through these things yourself using the guidance of the stages that you've essentially graduated from. So you're not driven solely by instinct. You're not driven solely by other people's opinions of you. You're trying to find a rational balance that's seasoned by your own experience, the particular situation, and importantly, um, your rationality. So Kohlberg had a set of um, definitions, right, or characteristics for each of these stages. And... Gilligan did too. Gilligan was Kohlberg's student, and she thought that the way that he's laid this out privileges men, and essentially it, um, it could lead you to the conclusion that men are more capable of, uh, you know, the, the, a full moral life than women are. So at this point, we're just going to take a look at how, what Gilligan did. Her notions, based on Kohlberg's, but, but tweaked, right? Gilligan said in the pre-conventional stage, people are self-centered, right? And it's the view that one's own needs are all that matters, and the goal is individual survival, as opposed to what Kohlberg said here. Now, for the conventional stage, Gilligan said, this is the self-sacrificing stage where others' needs are viewed as more important than your own. You know, not explicitly, but you sure act like it because of how important other people's opinions of you are. And also that it's quasi-altruistic. So to be good in the mind of somebody in the conventional stage is to care about others, even if it means sacrificing yourself, whether or not you're fully um, conscious of this. 
And then the post-conventional stage for Gilligan was what she called mature care ethics, where you balance your own needs with the needs of others. And if you have any principles by which you make decisions and, and resolve moral dilemmas, they'd be the principles of beneficence and non-maleficence, which really means um, doing good and avoid doing harm, right? Consciously try to do and promote good for yourself and others and don't do any harm to yourself and others. Hopefully that, you know, that doesn't that sound quite a bit like the Hippocratic Oath for doctors. Now, a little bit more on um, uh, Nell Nodding's theory based on Cal uh, excuse me, Carol Gilligan. Gilligan held that measuring progress by Kohlberg's model, like I said, resulted in boys being found to be more, more, <clears throat> more morally mature than girls. And this held for adult men and women as well. She's essentially saying that if you, if you put too much stock in Kohlberg's theory, it's going to give you the result that boys are more morally mature than girls and adult men are more morally mature than girls. And she objected to this. And further, she argued that Kohlberg's model was not an objective scale of moral development. It just doesn't always go down that way. And it's too rigid, in other words. And also, Kohlberg's model displayed a particularly masculine perspective on morality that's founded on principles of justice and abstract duties and obligations. And she said, perhaps it's the case that men reason morally this way, but that's not necessarily true for the way that women reason, um, reason morally. So back to Nell Nodding's theory of care ethics, some of her starting points. Um, well, first, she emphasizes subjective sentiment or feeling over objective and universal principles and focuses upon the role of others in our moral relationships. And she points out that when ethicists insist on universalizability, they argue that it must be the case that if under certain conditions X, you're required to do A, then under sufficiently similar conditions, you're also required to do A, right? So th that we are, that she's saying, she's criticizing the notion that, that you can reduce a particular situation to um, that any given particular situation is going to be able to be resolved by appealing to something universal, by a, to appealing to a universal principle. The particular situations have their own particular dynamics and set of circumstances and relations involved within them that universalize, uh, that universal theories simply cannot capture sufficiently. Um, also, Nottings believes that it's rare for the various conditions included in two different ethical encounters. She thinks it's rare that they're similar enough for one to declare that what I must do is the same as what you must do. That we can't, you know, bottom line here is there's no cookie cutter approach to resolving ethical dilemmas. You gotta get dirty in these things. And when by dirty, I mean just get in it and bang it out for its own particular circumstances. So on these grounds, she doesn't attempt to incorporate the concept of universalizability into the discussion of moral value judgments. So she makes a distinction between natural caring and ethical caring. And to qualify as a truly moral response, two types 
of caring must be present. Both of these, Nodding says. So, natural caring, first, she says, is a necessary condition of ethical caring. So, in other words, you got to first be capable of natural caring in order to be capable of ethical caring. And the ethical, excuse me, natural caring is a primal emotional response. And it's a moral attitude that arises out of the experience or memory of being cared for. Like from, um, you know, by your mother, for instance. So it exists amongst people toward their children, parents, and other close family relationships. And it can also extend to intimate romantic relationships as well as close friendships. Interesting point about natural care or interesting claim that Nottings makes is that, you know, you can derive your own implications from this, is that natural caring is a primal emotion, emotional response that comes from your experience or memory of having been cared for by like your mother, right? And this, in order to be ethically caring, this has to be satisfied. So um, you could argue then that if you weren't cared for, right? If there's nothing in your experience or memory bank of having been properly cared for, then you can never care, and hence you can never be ethical, ethically caring since this is a precondition for ethical caring. That's an extension of her distinction here. Now, on the other hand, she discusses ethical caring, which is a sufficient condition of natural caring. So in other words, ethical caring arises out of natural caring, like we just said. And ethical caring is a conscious choice to extend your natural caring towards individuals to whom you, you don't naturally experience caring feelings. Right? You've had these experiences before. You know what it means and what it feels like to naturally care for someone. And ethical caring, she's saying, recall that feeling. Bring it back and extend it to people who you don't have natural caring relationships for. Like, um, cross apply it, right? And also ethical caring is constitutive of ethical actions. In other words, ethical actions are constituted by or made up of the ethical caring response. Nodding says, an ethic built on caring strives to maintain the caring attitude and is thus dependent upon and not superior to natural caring. The source of ethical caring is then in twin sentiments, one that feels directly for the other and one that feels for and with that best self who may accept and sustain the initial feeling rather than reject it. So for Nottings, the ethical North Star, so to speak, is an ethical ideal. It's the image of the best of ourselves when we are caring and being cared for deeply and authentically. So this ideal is something that we should continuously strive to cultivate for ourselves. Remember, natural caring is one thing. Ethical caring as a virtue just like with Aristotle, it's got to be cultivated and practiced until it becomes part of you, right? So I bet you've heard, um, I know that, I'm, I'm certain that Oprah said stuff like, be your, the best version of yourself, right? When the idea behind that is imagine yourself firing on all cylinders, I guess, morally, right? 
picture, envision the best version of yourself and then try to behave that into existence. Well, Oprah didn't make that kind of stuff up. So essentially Aristotle's the, you know, I don't know if he made it up either, but it's one of the first sources we have that discusses ethics and behavior in this way. Um, but what Noddings is saying here is picture yourself being as sensitive and caring as you can possibly imagine and authentically you know what what would that look like or look out into the world and find examples of people who you think authentically care for themselves and others and try to behave that into existence because it doesn't come naturally. It has to be practiced and cultivated. So Nottings thinks that universalizing principles like Kant's categorical imperative or, um, or Mill's greatest happiness principle since they're unworkable in practical terms. I mean, they, it, it, they're laudable theories. They may resound with some people. They may have their place and time, but Nottings thinks they're unworkable or unmanageable in practical terms. Um, every moral situation is unique. It has its own special circumstances, its own special flavor, right? That's different from situation to situation and from relationship to relationship. And we can't assume that other people will confront moral choices that are sufficiently similar to our own for like the maxim in Kant's categorical imperative to have any meaning, right? Everyone ought to do X, period, right? Essentially what she's saying is this those sorts of universal principles suck the flavor and the seasoning right out of every particular moral situation. Be like the difference between eating a bowl of stew that has, you know, a really good stock and, and pepper and maybe a little Worcestershire and um, a little thyme. T H Y M E and a little, um, you know, obviously salt, right? But full flavor profile. She's saying, look, these universal maxims and principles take that delicious stew and essentially suck all the flavor out of it. Now you just got some protein and some vegetables in a bowl. Sorry to have carried that, my analogy so far. I think I'm hungry. And authentic human liberation and social justice, Nottings argues, can only be achieved by caring people in caring communities. So topics covered were care ethics as a reason slash emotion based situational moral theory and we looked at Nodding's particular version, and I did not include um, slides for the strengths and objections because they're really similar to those for virtue ethics.